So, wie schön. Herzlich willkommen zu unserer allerletzten Talkrunde des Tages. Der Talk wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Das heißt, ich werde jetzt langsam auf Englisch switchen. Wir haben Bianca Wiley mit uns. Ähm, der letzte Talk heißt Biting Back, Building Public Technologies. Es geht darum, zu fragen, wie wir unsere demokratischen Systeme durch Technologie wieder zurückerobern können und wie wir die Public Power in unsere Hände bekommen durch ähm, das Umbauen und Wiederaufbauen unserer eigenen Institutionen. Äh, Bianca Wiley ist Open Government Aktivistin und außerdem international renommierte Expertin für digitale Technologien und eben öffentliches Engagement. Sie ist Mitgründerin der von Digital Public und Tech Reset Canada und sie ist Senior Fellow of, um, vom Center International Governance Innovation. Dear Bianca Wiley, can you hear us? We'll have you inside with us in a second. We have you. Yay! Wonderful. Where are you right now? In which city? You're I'm, in Canada. I'm in Toronto. Fantastic. Hello to Toronto. Hello well, to so Toronto. You, you're already perfectly introduced and I could literally give you now the, the, the stage and everybody's listening to you in great That's expectations. Awesome. It's very dark, so I'm just trying to get some better light for you. Yes. Uh, there we go. Okay, that's a bit better. Got just my... for you to know, after you're going to be finished talking, Benjamin will take over from there. So don't be surprised if you meet another handsome stranger in front of your camera. Perfect. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that was a good way to get the blood pumping this morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Good, e good afternoon. Good morning from Toronto. I will do my best to keep this short because I'm very interested to have a conversation about these topics um, with, with Benjamin. Um, but I will give you a few quick points and then hopefully we'll have a conversation and learn a bit from each other. So a little bit of background. Um, it is now, uh, what are we? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a Sidewalk Lab story because it's how I sort of um, learn some of the things that I'm gonna share. But basically back in 2017 in Toronto, there was a smart city project that was launched and it was launched by a company called Sidewalk Labs in partnership with three levels of Canadian government um, through a public agency called Waterfront Toronto. So this project was called Sidewalk Toronto. And what I'm gonna do um, is share five points that I learned uh, because things that weren't done to my mind properly through that process give us some opportunity to do differently now in terms of uh, building technologies in our cities and making sure that they serve the public pub, public interest and that they're built democratically. Um, because this one major point I want to make is that there is nothing inevitable about the technology futures that we are being sort of um, given and a lot of the time our governments are being given and we need to get out of defensive mode you know this idea where you're always on your back foot trying to you know protect yourself from something we need to move into what do we want and what do we want to build and how does that look? And that requires that we change how we're working. So this major, if there's one key message, I think from everything and from that um, story in Toronto um, is that nothing is inevitable about technology and we really need to make uh, the technologies we want. And so I'm curious also to learn what's been working in Berlin and hopefully we can talk a bit about that. I think to that point, we need to get better at working as cities together globally to have more capacity and to share tactics um, for building public technology and sharing um, how we can do this work together uh, differently than it's been done so far. So five main points I'd like to share. I suppose the part of the story I should share before I start is that in 2017, there was an announcement about this smart city in Toronto that was gonna be a neighborhood built from the internet up and all the Canadian governments were very excited to share this and it was sort of like this is a good thing no one even considered that perhaps it was not a good thing so that was in 2017 and in 2020 um, the project was called off sidewalk labs left uh, the and said that due to the pandemic and a range of other um, you know circumstances that this in that moment um, that 
this wasn't a project that they were going to pursue. So um, I'm going to share five five things that I can you know um, share from that process, and I think they all uh, point us toward better ways to work. And the reason that for the name of this um, this conversation, saying biting back. Um, I don't know how many of you might be familiar with, there was an article published years, years back um, by someone who works in venture capital that talked about software eating the world. And they, um, I think that concept is interesting uh, because it's very difficult sometimes to see how software and technology is changing and evolving our spaces, our public spaces, our private spaces, our society. Um, and I think this idea that it's sort of eating away at things in, in, and it kind of reminds me not so much maybe of something large and monstrous, but almost more of a, got a bit of a mouse in the cables kind of, um, feeling that something's, you know, that, that these things are getting, uh, changed in, in little bites and pieces, um, which just made me think, and then I'm going to share my five points that, uh, I read something the other day. And I don't know if this will translate as well, but it said that uh, corruption and demagogues will eat you in small bites. And I liked it because sometimes it's hard to know at what point something important or major is happening because it's happening so slowly and over such short little pieces and bits and pieces. And you never think, oh, is that really bad? Is that bad? Is that bad? Is that bad? Until it's really bad. And I think we've let that happen with technology and in our democracy and in our political institutions, technology and tech companies have taken a lot of power. That's public power. And our governments have been giving it away in a lot of cases, unfortunately. And I think now we're at this point over decades that we need to realize that if we don't take that power back, we're already in a very diminished capacity because of the size of some of the companies, but they're not all big. It's the idea that the power of technology has sort of infiltrated some of our institutions. And I just say those things because we really need to pay attention to this in this moment with the pandemic, with the uprising, we're seeing this response to police brutality and generally anti-Black racism, you know, around the world, people standing in solidarity to push back and to ask for one major thing, which is accountability. So how do we have accountability in our systems? And now let's talk about five suggestions. And then I can't wait to talk more with this um, about this with Benjamin. So the first thing is about procurement. And what happened in Toronto, which was very problematic, was that when the government issued a request for proposal, it was asking for so many things. It was asking for city, it was asking for, you know, city urban planning elements, building ideas, streets, how people might live together, types of technologies, uh, economic development plans. How is this going to help the city make money? I mean, there was really no shortage. Um, and with that many things, it was very easy to lose track of the technology part of it because there was so much going on at once. I'm going to talk about that in more detail. But the major lesson with there is that we didn't talk enough about the technology because it was wrapped up in this thing that was about a city. And then you sort of mistake some of these really important infrastructural discussions because you're talking about having safe streets or having tall wooden buildings. And so procurements that involve technology, this is the first point, demand attention and they need to be written so that they embody what you want from a supplier or a vendor or a company. We shouldn't be negotiating and defending because a company wants to try its products on us. And then we have to figure out what's wrong with them or what's dangerous. That is completely wrong. And this is public money. So we need to see procurement when companies are asked to bid on things that we, the public, write the requirements of what they're gonna give us. And they can't do that, then they shouldn't be looking for public money. So that's the first thing, procurement, 
big tactical opportunity around getting better at um, both driving what is in a procurement, but also when you see a procurement that doesn't seem like it's got the public interest written into it, that needs activism. So that's a point of entry. So that's one thing. The second thing is about economic development. This is called different things in different countries. But in Canada, one of the things that made people excited about this project, if they didn't even understand technology, was that it was like, we're going to have a big urban technology industry because of this. And I think one thing that urbanists need to show up with technologists together and say, cities aren't products. We're not turning our cities into a lab for developing a whole bunch of technology products. This fundamentally goes against the things that we know cities need right now. If we think about both the anti-Black racism issues that we're all, but you know, more of us perhaps are looking and contending with, climate, both of those, a major element of, of resolution is investing in public infrastructure like public transportation. We know the kinds of technologies that we need to be investing in and some of them are older. So we need to show up and not allow this kind of industry to take hold too much necessarily. There is some good smart city technology. I wouldn't say most of it is, but there is exceptions. So I'm not trying to say the entire thing is a wash, but it's better as technologists to work with governments to again, identify the sectors where we think there's opportunity. Clean technology is one that there's some good clean tech, there's some scammy, you know, um, you know, it sounds good, but it's not really working. Technology and artificial intelligence has climate impact. It's not that there's zero impact. So we have to think about these things. So rather than saying we want to be the smart city industry leader, we need to say which industries do we want to you know, compete in and what do we want that to look at? But we really need to reject the idea that cities need a lot more technology right now, that, that that's somehow what's missing because politicians are very happy to announce that they're solving a problem with technology if it lets them off the hook for the financial investments they need to be making in cities. And I know that in our city, housing, major, transportation, major, those are two crushing crises. They're not technology problems, right? And when you layer technology into these things, it tends to be surveillant and it tends to punish people for use rather than anything that supports a better society. So that second thing is around economic development and challenging the idea of the city as a product, because I don't think that's on and I don't think many urbanists would agree that that's a great idea either. So we need to come more together on that point. The third thing is that the smart city, for some urbanists and some architects and some engineers and some designers and planners and, so many different people, they aren't challenging it. They're actually seeing it as something that makes them relevant now, makes them feel important or progressive or, well, I have technology in my portfolio, so I'm you know, better at these things or, or whatever. You know. um, what I see from my history of understanding urban planning, and we've got different, you know, different urban planners um, approach urban planning differently. <laughs> This is a nonsense thing to say, but um, not everybody is a problematic urban planner, but urban planning has a very deep history of discrimination, of technocracy, of not including the public in decisions. Um, it's discriminatory across many different levels. You know, open streets are not the same safety for everybody, as many of us know. And so, Urbanists who already don't understand how discriminatory cities can be, getting technology as a tool sort of turbocharges their worst instincts. And so what was important in Toronto and very challenging is that you had urbanists who, even though they meant well, um, didn't really care about the about the real details of the technology. They were happy to say, oh, this sounds neat. This is pretty. This looks good. We're going to put some data here. That sounds interesting. Fine. And then when it was too much and too complicated to talk about 
surveillance or to talk about privatization or to talk about control they said mm, that's too much we that's that's com we don't want to talk about that we want to talk about the design of the building and so they became a problem in some circumstances because the technology because it was mixed in um wasn't given its adequate uh you know size of um, attention so the third thing is that urbanists need to become more aware of to my mind the issues of these technologies and not take them as that they feel pressure to be like new and responsive and i'm on the cutting edge because i use technology in my planning there's some good technology to use in planning but we need to have a better understanding of it and i think planners like engineers have an um a uh, code of conduct where you have to say if i'm an urban planner i need to understand the implications of technology when i use technology or i support technology in public is it for everybody right is it for everybody um and that gets us back to why investments in core infrastructures and sort of saying no to some of the the hype of some of the technology is very very important um the fourth thing is about complexity uh and i learned this through the sidewalk labs project because they put out 1500 pages i'm trying to show you with my hands maybe this many this, it was this big it was as big as my head it was it weighed it was very heavy of a plan and the problem with that and this is what happens with technologists they make things very complicated and sometimes that's just a way to get people to sort of say, oh, that's complicated. I'm not getting involved in that. Sounds good, I guess. I don't know. I don't understand it. Or when you go into the details, you can't tell what's big and what's small. Like in Sidewalk Labs' plans, there was talks about digital identities. There was talks about infrastructures. Those aren't small things. That's not the same as having a tile that's heated and melts snow. They're very different orders of importance. And so when things are presented in a smart city context, it's all made very complicated. Um, it's important to be able to pull out the parts that are very big and important and make small the parts that aren't. Because frankly, with a lot of technology, it's not, and you can imagine, and I haven't even said the word yet, privacy is the thing people think is a big problem. It's it's a problem it's important but often there's a lot of trouble with privatization and when these things aren't made clear to people that you're laying systems down over public assets whether they're curbs parks water systems garbage management you're putting data infrastructures across those systems those are big conversations to have and they're not about what the data is it's the fact that are we commodifying our public spaces are we turning them into businesses are we letting people mediate our spaces become a, a something in between so the fourth thing is the complexity and making sure we protect space for some of those conversations because they're not short or small so you can't let that speed where people say okay yeah we're doing this you know this is this is the plan here are the component parts. We're going to have autonomous vehicles. We're going to have tall timber buildings. We're going to have, you know, X, Y, Z and snuck in the middle there is some very fundamentally important conversations about entire economies around our infrastructures. So it's important to be able to pick these things apart and pull out from the complexity what is large and important. Um, the fifth thing, and I just touched on it, is not privacy but privatization and this is you're going to hear this from me um constantly in our conversation if it if it makes sense because what's happening right now with a lot of technology is decisions that the public needs to be able to see or understand is getting wrapped into whether it's algorithmic whether it's machine learning whether it's just software spaces where we can't even see it anymore or understand where information is coming from and so shifting accountability into technical systems where not only not only do you not design those systems you're going to have companies telling you i can't show you how it works because it's a trade secret or because it's my intellectual property 
And if you think about what that means for democracy and accountability, when you need to understand how decisions are made about public assets in our cities, that is a non-starter. We cannot be letting that happen. So there's requirements we can write around any tools and how they have to be designed so that there has to be disclosure. But we as the public and we as the cities need to have better literacy around these things. Because when technology companies sit with the, with the public governments right now, they're not always meeting on equal terms to have conversations that are of equivalence. Because we know some of these big companies at this moment in time, what they have as information assets and what they understand about the technologies they are not disclosing and they have no impetus to disclose. So that's an area that we need to, again, and that brings us full circle, design how we want our technologies to be made because we can't just be ingesting things um, that people want to sell us because that's not going to let us design the futures that we want. Those were the five points. I'm super excited to talk now about those or anything else. And to tell me if any of that's wrong or you've had a different experience, please do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bianca. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. I can. I'm Benjamin. Hello, Benjamin. Hey. Hi. Hi. It's a pleasure to have you here, and thank you uh, for this amazing talk. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, you can imagine we've been following your work uh, quite closely. That's why we invited you for uh, the keynote. I think many people here in Berlin uh, know you from your engagement with Sidewalk Labs. So. Uh, I actually wanted to start discussing this with you. Now you already mentioned some of the points that interested me. But um, as you know, Berlin has its own history with engaging with Google, with the protests against the, the Google uh, campus here in Berlin. Yeah. And um, I'm sure many people would be interested in your like insider's perspective on, on how the Waterfront project uh, went wrong. Like, was it broken from the start, in your opinion? Or was there a certain point in the process where you realized this is not going to work? Yeah, it was broken from the start because this this thing that the government put out was too much at once. You know, it was like there was no role for a corporation to be deciding all of those things at once. Um, but to my mind, the part that broke it, interestingly, was many different um, communities seeing and critiquing it because the how, you know, from housing perspective, from a technology perspective, from an economic development perspective. Um, and so the the moment when some more of the public um outrage grew was when a document was leaked that made it very clear that they wanted to have a much larger development than the government or the company had ever told the public so they made that mistake because if they wanted to have this big big waterfront development they could have both been honest about it from the beginning but if you go back to when they launched they said oh we're just doing a little trial this is so typical technology. Oh, it's just small. No, you know, we'll see. And then if you like it, maybe there's more. There was no interest in this project at the size that they were talking about. And that's yeah. something that only when that was very well understood by the public did, did this start to become a bigger issue. But I'll tell you, I hold our government responsible for that, not Sidewalk Labs or Google, because our government right. knew that. And they knew that from the beginning. It was written. It was always in this complicated document. You could always look at the document and say, oh, we always said it could be big too, you know? So to me, that was the government, not the company. Speaking of which, I, I think you, you might agree that there is uh, often a certain lack of resources and knowledge and, and skills inside of government uh, when it comes to technology. Um, and what we learn here is that building these skill sets is actually a massive undertaking. You know, it it's, uh, takes a long time, it's very hard. So um, what, from a strategic point of view, in your opinion, would be the most, like maybe the three most important steps that a government should undertake in order to kind of gain or regain digital sovereignty? Yeah, so I think three things. One thing, when you do a procurement, you can mandate training and that you don't get stuck with that company necessarily. Because you can say, if you're, if you're, because we know who did this much better than the software companies, it was the consulting companies in the last 20 years, at least in North America. Uh, this was, you know, Deloitte, like companies that were doing, you know, coming in and doing digital transformation, PricewaterhouseCooper. Like if you look at all those companies, they became the outsourced technical advice. And so I think, one, one, one sort of step right now is to say, if you're doing a tender, 
you're going to train people on what you're talking about if the capacity is not in-house. Secondly, I think there's a lot of opportunity with open source if we're going to talk about code, you know, like as a requirement in a procurement, because then the governments can also lean on each other with some of this. This is what I mean about better coordination. We shouldn't be building all these super custom pieces of things because it doesn't help us build capacity. And then I think the third one is that there needs to be, and this is probably the hardest and the thing I've seen fail across the years, political leadership to invest in the public service. And I don't know, you know, when that pressure is going to hit hard enough, but I don't see the enthusiasm because we have great technologists in the public service. It's just a matter of um, restructuring some of the way the government uses technology so that it can be appropriately designed, right? So that, that last one, I think, is huge and very challenging. Yeah, that's actually, um, I, I really like that you talk so much about procurement because it's some, something that we discovered uh, over the last year. It's not really a sexy topic, you know, but it's so, so important actually to, to talk about procurement. And we had a session actually on procurement today um, because the way procurement works for the reasons that you mentioned um, um, seems kind of, kind of off or not ready for the digital age. Uh, especially when we see that projects, you know, also take a very long time and the results are not good, even though they're very expensive. Totally. So, um, and just a, just a quick point on that from sidewalk yeah. world. I could not believe, and I was until the last day that this, until this project was over, that a lawyer paid with public money signed off on the procurement document. I can't believe that because if I would look at that and I would say, I'm putting a real estate development corporation in charge of outsourcing a data governance regime to a Google sister company. They didn't know at the time, but they you know, definitely knew it could be one of the people responding. That is, I, I don't know what to say about that. It's one of these things, it's not illegal because we don't have laws about that, but the fact that a lawyer signed off on that, that I paid, frankly, blows my mind, right? And where do you go for recourse, right? So we have to think about those legal teams. A lot of what's happening now is only legal because there's no rules for it. That's what technology does all the time. It's not legal because it's supposed to be. It's legal because it's a vacuum. You know what I mean? So I just, because because you offered that point up, I wanna tell you for me very personally about Sidewalk, that over the years, I kept thinking, how is this legal? Right. So like it's not small what you just said to me in terms of really seeing where that process is problematic. That's a very serious place to like hone in on for me. Yes. And, and this term of like the governance vacuum is what you call it. Um, yeah. it's, uh, I like that a lot uh, in your writing because we kind of discovered this this vacuum over the last year during our work as well, um, which which basically is. I think the reason is that you know digital transformation is, is pretty new territory and governments are not that fast in, in actually adapting uh, to it and then big tech companies might move in and take advantage of that. But one thing that, that we were wondering is um, are there ways to fill this vacuum in a more like positive way, for example through bottom-up innovation, through citizen participation, because that's kind of what we're trying to do here at CityLab to engage with these technological questions in a very um, hands-on mode, or as you said, to get out of the defensive mode. Totally. Actually creating stuff, setting up infrastructure, developing open source code, and just, you know, yep. do things, make things happen. Um, and, to, and, and then you can argue, okay, this exists now, you know, it's just yep. here, we can use it. Yep. Um, so I guess I guess my question would be, could this this vacuum that you mentioned be also, also be like a breeding ground for new forms of innovation that come out of civil society? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is a great question. And I'm about to participate in the city of Toronto's uh, digital infrastructure plan, public engagement. And so I think that's a fantastic place for us to intervene as urbanist technologists is to talk about the infrastructure level, because I think historically we've gone to that level where you say, what are the standards? What are, so that you, because I think trying to manage these issues on a product by product basis we will never be able to keep up. It won't work. So we need to build standards level infrastructural thinking that the public says, if 
if you're going to be building products, they have to be built around these sorts of protocols or literal standards, you know, like we have standards, like we have in, you know, for some people in urbanism, um, building standards and codes might help, you know, think about something similar that you build those requirements for products and you say they have to be able to be, whether it's open or infrastructural, um, like having, um, having processes around them so that they can always adapt because, and I'll, I'll answer this more specifically, but I, I just wanna point something out. Because software is never finished, you need to have persistent process with it, right? It's not the same as procuring a helicopter, a pencil, a, you know, a jet, like it's, it's, it's always moving. And that's both a liability because you can say, I'm fine with it. And then a company can push up software release and then be like, wait, what just happened? But it also means that we can take power back of products that exist right now by forcing new requirements on them, right? So it can go both ways. And so what I think we need to do with our governments is think about process solutions, not product solutions. We need to think about how do we stay at the table so that you try, you know, you, you, you say, this is how our infrastructure has to work, our digital infrastructure. And the other reason that's beautiful um, there's a woman I work with, her name's Aliyah Batya, who talked about hyper-local smart cities. Because we also need to have the ability that, you know, Berlin is large, Toronto is large. Maybe at a neighborhood level, you're going to want different settings. So how do you make it so things can even operate and respond to a, to a more local um, version of what the community might want, you know? And so I think all of that means that what the best way to engage with governments is on a process basis to say, I want to be at the table. I want to be here to talk about your procurements. I want to be here to talk about your infrastructures. We can build plans, but we're always going to have to change them. So how do we stay involved like that? I think that's really, really important because I think on the product side, um, it's, it's way harder to keep up with product by product. It's way, way harder. And then you're always like on the defense, I think. Um, but I do think, uh, just as one more point, like I said, there is some good smart city tech, like there is, I, I know people who work in it, like they're good. And, they're, and they've told me, they said, if this business model is bad for society, I don't want to live in it either. So like, I'm not interested in pushing bad tech, but you may be in the same situation as we are in Canada, where this nationalism, it's like, I was laughing sometimes saying, I don't want Canadian surveillance either. Like the problem here is not just that this is you know, a, a, an American tech giant, it's that the, the the products are a problem. So the problem is if it comes from a Toronto company, I don't want it either, you know? And that's why we need to be very careful um, in there to think about how we engage and try to engage at a systems level around design and process and planning rather than one-off, one-off, one-off kind of thing. All right. So getting back to the role of uh, civil society in this whole thing, um, I think in, in Germany over the last months, we kind of witnessed the discovery of the so-called digital civil society on a broader scale because of Corona and there was a huge hackathon. There was the release of the Corona tracing app from the government that was released as an open source app actually and was closely like followed and, and supported through civil society like volunteers. Um, so there, there seems to be like a growing recognition that civil society can actually play a vital role in the digital transformation. But on the one hand, there is this, there is this question whether like public infrastructure that is maintained by volunteers, you know, is that a, sustain, a sustainable model, like volunteers who compensate the lack of resources from government, which is also always a bit problematic. So I was wondering, uh, on uh, what side you are on, on like uh, government run infrastructure versus like self organized citizen run digital yeah. infrastructure which also exists in berlin for example yeah. or maybe there there might even be some new forms of cooperation between both sides you know on the digital field i think your last version would be the one i would hope we can build from here because i don't think the state i mean i think it's so important not to be what what i you know in an a historical like to pretend like the state has used technology in an equitable way up until now because they haven't. So there's not trust with a lot of community because a lot of technology has been used to surveil, you know, racialized people. So it's hard for me to say, yeah, like state, and I do it, I argue for the state to be in charge, but there's a very good reason 
not to let the state only be in charge, right? And so I think this is where this model between community and state, because the reason I don't like the community side also comes back to equity, because who has time to do and run a lot of the community technology? And it's like many other things in civil society, there's an underrepresentation of the people who may suffer the greatest harm. So even though, you know, community is not inherently representative either, right? Like I know from my time in the open data space or the civic tech spaces, you had a lot of people who had the time on their hands. Do they represent people with children, uh, even just from a demographic perspective? Who's, you know, which, because you know, I'm saying like there's a broad range of factors in terms of who participates in some of those spaces, right? And so I think it's something about a, a new combination of both. I also, and I think as uh, you know, in Germany, this resonates, I want people to be paid well for their work. This is not a joke, right? Our digital infrastructures are incredibly important. And you think about coronavirus and the pandemic and, and education, you've got kids in North America who are getting driven to parking lots to try to do homework from the Wi-Fi from a restaurant because they don't have the internet. Like that is the state's problem. So I think dividing the problem into its pieces as well, right? Like big infrastructure investments like subways, communities can't come together and really do those ones. So I also think the scope of the problem helps us identify the actor, core, core fundamental infrastructural investments, state. Defining some of the how it's working might make more sense at a community level and might be more civil society. But how do we build infrastructural requirements that interface well with you know, community participation. Because the last thing I'll say, I don't know how many times you, you've you used open source software, but I can tell you, it's not a user-friendly experience in the same way that a lot of the, you know, productized and commercial products are. And so asking people to be like, oh yeah, use this instead. And then you go and you're like, I don't have time for this. Like I can't. And, and that community maybe stuck on resources to invest in, you know, user design. So again, it sort of privileges a certain type of user. And I think that's a problem. So those are some thoughts on that. I really would love to see the two come together better because I think both of them historically have been problematic independently. So maybe there's something with new pressure that comes out of this time and into something new. It's time for new things, man. We can't keep doing the same things. <laughs> this is my motto right now. If I've been doing it before, right. stop. You know, like it's not working, buddy. Knock it off. <laughs> uh, Bayanka, this is a great conversation and I hope we can uh, continue it in the near future. <laughs> but I also want to give people from the audience uh, the opportunity to, to ask a few uh, sure. questions right now because there are some in the chat. Uh, and I think Bayanka is taking over from here and uh, forwarding these questions to you. So it was a pleasure to talk to you in person and um, I hope uh, we can do this again soon. Thanks. Likewise, thank you so much. Let's pick up for sure. Thank you. Great. Bianca, thank you. Stay with us for a second. I have two uh, interesting questions from the chat that I picked up. So one came a bit earlier. It was asking, should the public procurement always go for the solutions that are open source anyway? So would you go for public money, public codes? make the investment that way, or would you go for regulating um, the product of the private companies? What's yeah, that? yeah I, think, I think it's one of these ones where, where, it's, where it's possible, if it's open source, it's good, but it can't be the only requirement. I mean, I think we've seen how this has failed us with the cheapest one or the fastest one, right? So I think it's, it should be a requirement but I don't think it should be the only requirement. And what you get into then is what is the rationale if it's not open? And then you can open that door and then have those conversations and understand the trade-offs. Because for some people, and I mean, I really empathize with, with technology business people to say, you know, you're trying to do a thing, you're investing, you're working, you know, you're, you're doing, um, you're spending time and capital in a way and maybe that's not the way that you want to do it. And we shouldn't be too restrictive to that. Um, and I also think we have to consider time. Because we're in such a bad regulatory, I would say vacuum or deficit, the harms that can be happening now in closed technology are much higher. 
if we get into places where we've done better regulatory and other standards and other thinking, I don't think those harms are as great. You know, like I think that's that's why we need to think about this strategically along different levels. We can't try to solve it all with it being open source. And I and I frankly I'm concerned if the only things now we'll be thinking about open source because we may miss out on a lot of great stuff, and that's not the point. Mm. So um, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, that's um, the second question that was from Victoria Buck, who gave a speech earlier. Um, she asked, and maybe that's the same in the US and Canada. Um, the question is, how can we as a civic tech society, civil society, best influence our governments? Because uh, it sometimes sh seems to be wrong decisions made out of a huge lack of literacy in those yeah. countries. So often they're not even meaning bad, but it turns out really bad decision. How, yeah. from your experience, can we best influence those decision makers to not make this uh, strategic mistakes? This is, I think about this every day. This is such a great question because I'm trying to get out of getting angry about it and get into helping about it because it's hard not to get mad because if anybody has the money and the resources to have literacy in their staff, it's the government, you know? So I think it's important to not let that just be like, well, they don't know. Like, I think we have to keep pushing on them to say, then find some people who know. There are enough mm -hmm. technologists that you could be getting a little you know, better guidance on. But I think the, the other issue here is that the lobbying um, that happens in North America is so pervasive in terms of you know, pushing the um, economy side of the story. So the governments are mixing up the economy with the implication on the state and the mm -hmm. society, right? And so that is its own, like that's a, that's a harder slice of it because that's actually more social and economic than it is them not knowing about the tech, right? So that's the one that I'm, I've always found to be more trouble and it doesn't have to do with them understanding or having good people on technology. It's a different um, rationale. So I am puzzling about that too. And I am constantly just like my, my only thing right now that I think is working sometimes is demanding accountability. Because sometimes you're like, it's not enough for you to tell me that this is the future. Tell me how it works. And then sometimes you see people start to say, right, I don't have an answer for that. That's that's not good. And um, I think that is probably the better track to go down with this is just to remind them, you don't get to spend money on things that affect all of us and then tell us you're not even sure how it works. Or have you thought about all of these consequences? And then they say, not really. And you think, okay, <laughs> then maybe, and this goes to the, the idea of time, I just want things to slow down right now. You know, I just want less because I know it is not the place where we're going to solve our major crushing societal problems anyway. So to take a little bit of time to get tech right, I always say go slow so you can go fast. Like just figure it out and then you can go faster and be excited about all those things because we're not as worried about all the harm um, because we've resolved it, right? So I think I think slowing things down is a big step and that can be done by demanding accountability and like just saying, because people get uncomfortable when they realize that they can't mm. answer the question, right? So you don't even need to come with the answer. You just need to come with the question and be like, that was a lot of sidewalk labs. It was like, do we have rules for this? Then everyone kind of being like, you know, you can imagine the emails getting sent around. Do we have rules? For it? No, actually we don't. Oh, oh. Okay, time to start making rules, you know, like we'll make the rules over here. Uh, yeah, so I think asking questions, requesting accountability, and just um, being persistent about it. And last piece on this, and this came out of a great conversation I had yesterday with a woman named Imi Kaur about um, just needing to make other people confident that they can challenge on this. Because you don't need to be a big tech expert to show up and say, what, how does this work? What are the, you know, what are the implications? What are the protections? How is it designed? You don't need to be a product manager. You don't need to be a tech expert. You don't need to be a big, you know. So I just think building confidence across civil society so that advocates who advocate for transit can ask those questions. Advocates that advocate for housing can ask those questions. Because the tech is layering in everywhere, right? 
you're going to get pandemic safety tech in an apartment building. Like you can see it coming. So you need the housing people to be able to push back, not just the technologists, right? So I think that's some of that other, that's another approach is make sure everybody feels good. And you give them a couple of questions and say, don't worry if you don't know. I don't know either, but here's the questions. That's such a beautiful tech and also a really good thing to take away. So I will even translate in German. So uh, it's to, to, we can influence our leaders by asking the question, tell me how it works. And if you can't, you don't get to decide on which technology we choose. So it's a big call for tech literacy and accountability, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just in German, so auf Deutsch Fragen stellen, wie es funktioniert, wer es nicht erklären kann, hat meistens die falsche Grundlage zu entscheiden, welche Technologie benutzt wird. Super. Thank you so much, Bianca. This is really inspiring. Our chat loved it. Yay. Um, thank you so much. It was very, very big picture and precious to hear to you. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you so much. That was such a pleasure. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. And thank you for all your work oh, there. I feel all of us together linking arms. It's fantastic. Yes, that's what I felt too. Thank, thank you, you so much. Have a great Bye. day. Stay safe. You too. Bye, Bye. Bianca. Cheers. Cheers.